Your events, the future of mobility, data driving innovation. Presented by Arity. Here's our host, transportation reporter, Mark Matusik. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us. Today, we're gonna to take a closer look at how mobility technology is transforming consumer habits and the role data plays in making transportation safer, cleaner, and more accessible. Before we dive into these conversations, I wanted to run through a couple of housekeeping items. First, I wanna thank all of you for joining us and all of our speakers for participating in today's live event presented by Arity. Please share today's conversation by using the hashtag insider events. Also, this is more than just a webinar. You might have noticed the dashboard at the bottom of the page. Feel free to check out speaker profiles and additional resources provided by our speakers in the dashboard below. You can also submit questions right there. We also invite you to take the attendee survey at any time during the events. Just click on the survey icon at the bottom of the page. And now, let me introduce our first session. Urban mobility is the lifeblood of modern cities, a critical economic factor, and a facilitator of smart and sustainable development. Our Smart Cities and Urban Mobility panel is moderated by insider transportation reporter, Alexa St. John. Over to you, Alexa. Thanks very much, Mark, and hello, everyone. You know, smarter cities have long been considered the pathway to better and faster urban mobility solutions. Smart city development and better urban mobility overall can help reduce long-standing systemic disparities and create safer roadways. But the evolution of our cities is not only critical from an equity and safety standpoint, it's critical to the economy too. Smarter cities are expected to create $2.46 trillion in business opportunities across the globe by 2025, just four years. And now the key is that this needs to work in conjunction with existing infrastructure and at the same time align all of the stakeholders necessary to help cities naturally evolve for the future. Our future cities need to be multimodal and draw together all forms of mobility. They need to enable the transition of our vehicles to electric and self-driving and they need to ensure that the forms of transit and infrastructure being implemented is ultimately more efficient more sustainable and more equitable. But the benefits of smarter cities in the future of urban mobility is just one aspect to consider as our transportation systems evolve. As this is all happening, a lot else needs to align. Automakers and tech companies are a major part of this future, but the government also plays an important role. And much of this lies on consumers too. So joining me now to discuss the opportunities and future of our cities are Trevor Paul, Chief Mobility Officer for the State of Michigan, Oliver Cameron, Vice President of Product at General Motors Autonomous Electric Car Unit Crews, and Shimpei Zay, Uber's Director of Policy, Cities, and Transportation. Thank you all so much for being here today. Now let's talk about all of these ideas for a minute. Shinpei, I'd like to start with you. What really is a smart city? What makes a smart city? Are these still a topic of interest anymore? Tell me more. Sure, thanks. Thanks for having me. Smart cities have been around, that term has been around for a really long time, but what it really speaks to in my mind is the ability to uh, be flexible, to be adaptable, to be resilient, to help cities overcome challenges and respond to future need. And I also think it speaks to the need to center the people of the city um, and to use technology as a way of making that possible. What you spoke about was the integration of a lot of different stakeholders, uh, outcomes, uh, different systems. And what we want to try to do in smart cities is to use technology as a way of bringing that all together. Some of the ways I think about doing that is, you know, perhaps during the pandemic, we really discovered that our assets, our public assets in cities, have been underutilized. Um, you know, parking spaces, for example, are typical, typically underused, um, and we repurpose them. We open streets, we created parklets. There's outdoor dining all over the, all over in cities all over the world, for once. And and there was uh, an ability to also accommodate that with uh, changing transit lines, uh, with pickup drop-off zones, with more delivery. And so you're starting to see how technology. 
uh, played a role in enabling the changes in the physical space that, to accommodate the ways people were moving around um, and also to um, make it possible to then consider future development in the way that the cities would, would evolve. Absolutely. I'm hoping to build on that with, with some other perspectives. You know, what exactly makes a city smart versus simply a city that's evolving for the future and, and just getting better? Oliver, maybe we can start with you. Is this more so the idea of retrofitting existing cities? I believe so, yes. Uh, you know, people own cars often because it's the most convenient option, uh, not because it's the cheapest, the easiest, or uh, perhaps the most reliable form of transportation. And, you know, folks that live in cities, of course, prioritize getting from point A to B as reliably and time effectively uh, as, as possible. And, you know, when I think about making a city smart or uh, a city being retrofitted uh, to become uh, better than it currently is, to me, of course, with our work at Cruise, a lot of that is about giving folks more options giving folks more reliable options, giving folks safer options, cheaper options to get around, uh, get around their cities. And uh, that's, you know, something that I personally find really exciting about, about Cruise, where when we look at the options that currently exist within cities, there's really so much opportunity to improve just what it means to get around a city and to offer far more options, far more democratized access to, to safer transportation. So. You know, when I think about smart cities, it conjures in people's heads these utopias that you think about, you know, 20 years ago were, were held up as the cities of the future. I think much of what uh, is, you know, happening in cities is a little evolutionary. And that's OK. That's exciting. Right. Because, again, it gives folks more options and, and, uh, and more access to things in their cities. Trevor, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, when I think smart cities, I don't necessarily think smart as in uh, efficiency, and maybe that's just the role that I have in government. I think of it as like safety, a greener city, a city that upholds a person's dignity. And so a lot of times when I hear smart city, I start with the problems. Like right now it's emissions, it's congestion. And so how can we leverage data platforms 5G to allow various city assets to talk with one another. You know, maybe it's as simple as having a streetlight talk to a set of safety glasses in a construction zone um, to make that particular intersection safer. Um, smart city, I think a big misnomer with smart cities is that you just turn a, or you play a, flip a switch and all of a sudden the entire city is smarter. The truth is it starts with intersections, it starts with sidewalks, it starts with use cases, it starts with individuals. And once you have the right data, you can begin to make better decisions about how you how you use your streets, how you use your buildings. And ultimately, that's going to lead to more options, transportation options, uh, movement options for both people and goods in a city, which then, if you're using better data, better decisions, better operations, that's going to lead to affordability at the end of the day. So it's going to be a little cheaper to ride the bus. And then everyone wins, or whatever sort of micromobility option there is. Um, so... There's a lot there. I, I mean, I love this topic. Alexa, you're the right person to be talking about it. <laughs> I appreciate that, Trevor. Um, you touched on this a bit already, but I'd love to hear, Shinpei, from your perspective uh, with Uber, You know how smarter cities can enable these effective and equitable uh, urban transportation solutions. You mentioned earlier, too, there's so many different stakeholders. Uh, you come at this with a unique perspective. Yeah, I, I think there's such a unique opportunity right now to see what's going on, especially with the pandemic, all the ways that we've kind of changed our behavior, changed travel patterns, but also to really recognize what was essential. Um, at the same time, we've seen enormous, um, you know, the inequities that have always existed became so much more visible. Recent analysis that we did at Uber showed that during the pandemic, there was very consistent use of ride hail from lower income neighborhoods uh, in, in comparison to higher income neighborhoods. So while you know all transportation dropped, there was a very steady sort of use and recovery of ride hail use um, in lower income neighborhoods. And many of those trips took people to essential jobs, to hospitals, to distribution centers, 
um, even to parks because maybe you know parks are on the outs outskirts of a city that are they may not be so well served by transit. So what this said to us is that you know technology can kind of fill gaps where there might be an enormous disruption, um, that it can overcome some you know systemic barriers. Some of these lower income communities are a result of decades of, of policies that have created the situation where they are cut off from opportunities, cut off from um, ability to get to jobs, schools, medical care. And we see the use of technology here in helping to kind of give them some insurance. So let's say they do take the bus, they can rely on ride hail um, to, to make sure that they get to their job. But, you know, and it's every so often, maybe it's not every single day, but there is a consistent use there that we thought was really interesting during this time. Trevor, I want to go back to you for, for this one. You know, you mentioned your role in government, and I'm curious about the challenges in terms of aligning political will, uh, this technological development, and uh, all of the necessary other industry stakeholders to make smart cities and more equitable urban mobility happen, uh, really to work cohesively and bring together existing infrastructure. Um, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, it's... You're right. It's a delicate dance. Um, and I think the role of, of, for instance, my office, which is focused on future mobility, is to begin to draw the through lines between effective policy and dynamic programming. Um, you know, a lot of times policies have a blanket effect. However, you know, a policy may, may work better on one street or one part of town than it does on the other part of town. And so a lot of, and I mean, you marry that with technology that's moving at a speed that's much faster than the public sector and, and Policymakers uh, are moving. You, you have a situation where um, you you have the technology to solve a problem. However, you don't necessarily have a set of rules that allows you to do that. Um, so for our for I guess our team, uh, you know, we wake up every morning thinking about how can we tell the story of, for instance, um, you know, DSRC technology at an intersection and how that extra split second of data that a sensor can provide you can be the difference between whether you make it out of a traffic accident or not. Um, and I think that more that we can begin to humanize some of the engineering terms and begin to sort of introduce policymakers to industry more frequently, I think we'll be able to move a bit faster to set, set up laws and, and set up various um, procedures that speed up the ability uh, to be smart. Uh, now, the one thing I'll add coming out of the pandemic, it was really cool in Detroit to see how quickly the city uh, reacted to um, the restaurants only being able to serve takeout and changing ordinances overnight that allowed for delivery zones, uh, pickup zones. And I'm hoping that that sort of sets the standard going forward uh, for governments to react. Uh, in a way that, that moves the the market. Absolutely, that's really important. Uh, Shinpei or Oliver? Yeah, I was just thinking a lot about this um, partnership that you mentioned, Trevor, about working with agencies. I mean, it was really clear during the pandemic that public agencies could pivot and that, you know, the, for smart cities, it's not a matter of whether or not the technology exists, it's how it's applied, it's where it's applied, how it's tailored. How does it help support the resiliency that I think a lot of cities exhibited during the pandemic? One of the few ways that we did that at Uber was work closely with transit agencies to provide uh, first last mile uh, service, to um, provide a guaranteed ride, ride home because transit service was cut off late at night, um, or um, we continue to double down on transit investments. We, we connected walking with ride hail with transit journey planning, so you can get the whole door-to-door -door experience. Um, we also saw a lot of, um, you know, we also saw a lot of cities to that point about outdoor dining, just rethink their curbs. And yes, there's more pickup drop-off. That, nece that, that isn't necessarily a technological innovation, but what it does do is provide then the additional space to increase the performance of the curb and and think rethink what retail might be, 
rethink what dining might be and just and just rethink you know the use of our streets which is the biggest public space that we have in our cities we have a team set up uh, called the mobility solutions team that works really closely with large institutions um, venues large venues and cities on thinking through these solutions and thinking through how do you maximize the multimodal aspect and phase out the application of technology so that you can reduce parking, increase the performance of your assets, and, and also think about that future state where you know hopefully you come out of this pandemic and some of these things and innovations, the policy innovations and the space innovations and technological innovations stay in place. Now, we've talked a lot about uh, the accessibility piece, the role of government. Uh, obviously, we mentioned sustainability earlier as well. And, you know, in light of the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report on the state of global climate, you know, taking into account various weather disasters that we've experienced across the U.S., you know, the shutting down of the New York City subway due, due to extreme weather, um, Tahoe being evacuated, countless examples. I'm curious how urban mobility solutions and smarter city infrastructure can help communities deal with these sorts of disasters. Uh, Oliver, can you talk about that and, and how crews might fit in? Absolutely. The planet is telling us something, right? And it's important we listen and important that we act because uh, clearly things are headed uh, in the absolute wrong direction. Uh, crews specifically, you know, we get a lot of attention on our machine learning capabilities, robotics, and of course, self-driving cars. But a huge part of our mission is around sustainability. We, we strongly, strongly, strongly believe that every single autonomous vehicle should be an electric vehicle. If an autonomous vehicle um, is shared, it absolutely must be an electric vehicle. And uh, you know, in order to drive the fundamental change that we need to see for um, ultimately addressing climate change, one of the ways, and there's many, many ways, is that you can have a fully electric fleet of shared vehicles in cities. And our fleet, cruises fleet, is 100% uh, uh, fully electric and powered by renewable, uh, from renewable sources. Um, and, you know, talking about cities, um, it's my understanding that about 88 of the top 100 US cities um, have less than half of the necessary charging infrastructure uh, necessary to handle electrification at scale today. And improving this situation is going to be critical to, again, uh, accelerate the adoption of EVs and, again, further help um, prevent the crazy climate change that we're seeing today. So Cruz cares about sustainability, and the way we show that is action, uh, because all of our AVs are fully electric, and by uh, accelerating the change to shared electric transportation. Hopefully we can make a dent uh, in the climate change um, issue that, uh, that's going on right now. Now, I'm curious, you know, what what all your visions are for the the future of urban mobility. Um, there are a lot of solutions that need to be implemented, uh, a lot of things that need to be aligned. Uh, technology is there. Um, and I imagine really complementary, diverse technologies, multimodal forms of transportation, of course, rather than any sort of, you know, mass displacement of, of one service in particular. Um, Oliver, I'd love to start with you. What does your vision look like? Paint us a picture. Absolutely. Well, it begins by clear collaboration, right? So collaboration between the AV companies or the transportation companies uh, and the cities. And then really importantly, it's not just about that collaboration, although that is key. It's about collaboration with the residents of the city itself. If you are simply solving a problem for the city and not for its residents, then you're not really solving a problem at all. So Cruz specifically in San Francisco has invested a lot of time and energy in making sure what we're building is something that the city wants and that we continuously listen to the city and its, its residents uh, to make sure that we're building the right things at the right time. Um, that said, when it comes to working with cities, one of the decisions we made early on is that we're not dependent on the city making modifications. We fully embrace the city as it is today, and we learn to handle all that the city has to throw at us. We're not dependent on new infrastructure. We're not dependent on 
you know, 5G or any sort of new technology being installed within the city. Uh, we simply try and fit in with what the city currently has today. And it turns out that it's a very hard problem. Of course, infrastructure can help make your life easier, but it comes at a cost. And driving in San Francisco is incredibly complex, specifically autonomously. Uh, we, we believe it's about 40 times the complexity uh, of driving in suburban areas. And again, we're, we're rising to that challenge and excited about it. But all of this comes down to get, again, the basics. You work with the city, you work with the residents, and you fit in. You're not dependent on modifications or changes that, uh, as we know, technology changes very fast. And uh, that can, uh, can be challenging for sure. Trevor, from your point of view, what should the public really expect to see moving forward? Electrification, vehicle electrification, more chargers, uh, a more seamless charging experience, uh, a demystifying of uh, electric vehicle ownership. So uh, that feeling you get, I, I know in Detroit, people don't want to necessarily buy electric vehicles right now because you can't drive them up north. There's not enough chargers. So making sure that as people leave cities, they feel comfortable leaving cities in their electric vehicles. Um, you know, as of 2017, I think uh, emissions from transportation passed that of built infrastructure around the world. So if we can get if we can get electric vehicles right or clean cleaner fuels right, I mean that really does in some ways stop climate change in its tracks. Now, as it relates to autonomy, I think you know the future is bright for for cities probably first in the way goods are moved around cities. Uh, in fact, just last week, we, we launched a new last mile robot delivery service in uh, Detroit's Porktown neighborhood with KiwiBot that uh, is like a little beer cooler with wheels that can deliver medicine and consumer goods and other things. Making sure that we can figure out those sorts of use cases will then I think pave the way for more passenger autonomy. Uh, but you know, for me, the city, the future of the city is gonna be safer. It's gonna be a little quieter uh, you're going to have more information at your fingertips, more options to move around and, and see your friends and family and experience the city in new ways. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, that you know, things, things look good. The future is bright. Uh, even though we've been through a lot in the last year, the deployments that we're seeing across the U.S. and across the world give me hope that, you know, 2030, we're going to see some of these big global problems um, be less because we've leveraged automated, connected, shared, and electric technology. That's fantastic. Shinpei, I'll give you the final word here. Thanks. Um, well, one of the things we did during the pandemic was to double down on our vision of the future, which is a sustainable one, a resilient one. We made a commitment to be a zero emission platform by 2030 in the US and Canada and around the world globally. And this is the platform, you know, our entire platform, all the different businesses on our platform. Um, I think what Trevor, both Trevor and Oliver said really resonate with me, um, and particularly the opportunity to overcome some of those inequities that we spoke about earlier, both the uh, resilience to shock that we saw to climate events and extreme weather events, um, on-demand technology can help provide an immediate response as we did in Cape May during Hurricane Ida. Um, but also planning for the future, helping with the electrification transition. One of the things that we launched in 2019 was a clean air plan in London as a res in response to the ultra low emission zone that the city had set up. But what it did was fund a uh, creative fund for drivers to help them get into electric vehicles. And as many people know who have been working on this, electrification, marketing, a lot of the kind of resources are directed at households that are uh, in the upper middle, upper income brackets, not the lower income brackets. And we think that this next decade is all about figuring out how we can make all of these different kind of innovations for uh, climate change, for resiliency, much, much more accessible to more people. And, then, and that's just really the final thought here is, a smart city is a is a city for people. It's a it's a human centered city, and technology here is just the tool to make it happen. I'm really excited about all the ways that we can do that and the role that Uber plays in making that possible. Uh, but uh, I want to make sure that we understand that people are at the heart of it and and how we get through this 
all these emergencies and our long-term goals um, is, is really important. I think that's a great final note to end on. Uh, I know we could all talk about this for hours, but I appreciate your thoughts in, in the minutes that we had. You know, what we've really been hearing is that there's a vision of transportation moving forward that's certainly multimodal. It's not just cars or public transit or even shared mobility. It's really all of these forms uh, working together. And the evolution of smart cities and urban mobility requires a variety of stakeholders. It's going to be the automakers and the tech companies, governments and the citizens all collaborating on this. Um, and really the future of our cities and transportation systems, it's not just a boost to the economy, but it's critical for sustainability, making our cities greener, making our world greener, and equity, of course, making them far more accessible than they are today. Uh, but thank you so much, Trevor. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, thank you, Shinpei, as well. Thank you all for being with us. Um, I'm Alexa St. John again, and I know over the next several years, we'll certainly be covering this uh, at Insider. But thanks all for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Alexa. And thank you so much, Trevor, Shinpei, and Oliver, for giving us a preview of what the cities of tomorrow might look like. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we move around. Our next guest will explain some of the key changes in our driving and travel habits and what they mean for the future. Algren, the president of Arity, and Mark Coffey, an executive vice president at GasBuddy, about how driving has changed since the beginning of the pandemic and which of those changes will stick. Gary's going to start by sharing some of the key insights from Arity's new reports about this year's top driving and travel trends. Take it away, Gary. Great. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for joining us today. Um, Arity collects data. We've collected over almost 600 billion miles of, of driving data, and in doing that, uh, we, we developed some really unique insights about how people move. So I want to spend just uh, like five minutes today before we um, open up the panel to talk a bit about uh, what we've seen. Uh, we had a report that came out uh, about a year ago and then another one this spring, and, and we decided to release one now because we're seeing some pretty interesting interesting trends. So if we could put that um, that up, we call it life in the fast lane, and I think that'll become uh, apparent as we, we go forward. But we collect this data to enable advertising, to enable insurance pricing, to enable a lot of different things, but it, it allows us with a unique view of how people move. Uh, one question we always get is where does the data come from? So it's an anonymized aggregated data set that we get from our publisher partners. So we work with companies like GasBuddy, we'll talk to Mark in just a little bit, um, but others as well to, uh, to gather this data and uh, really get a sense of, of how people are moving, um, where they're going, when, and, and kind of how. So there's three insights that I want to cover today. The first one is, is kind of how much that, uh, that they are driving. And if you look at the slide uh, coming up with the, uh, the, the graph, um, the way this slide works is if you look down the Y axis, there's 100 there. 100 is the average driving for 2019. You can see people tend to drive a little bit less in the wintertime and a little bit more in the summertime, but that's an average. So based everything from 2019 average is the way to think about the slide. When you look at that, uh, the blue line that drops from 2020, it was just simply amazing. Uh, well, maybe not too surprising because they, everyone did uh, shelter in place for the most part throughout the country, but it, it dropped like 50% of driving miles and it just changed dramatically. And then it started to come up towards the, the latter part of the year, but still never got to really normal until the beginning of this year. Then the beginning of this year hit, and while there was a little dip in February, it took off like crazy. And now we're running about 10% above what 2019 was like. So if you get the sense that people are driving more and driving differently, you're right. Why does this matter? It matters because industries are really driven on this. The, the insurance industry, you know, the amount of time you're spending miles on the road really matters. The automotive ecosystem really matters. When I think about autonomous vehicles and the future of, of new cars and EVs, as our last panel was talking about, the idea of duration of trips and how much they're driving is really going to matter. So right now we're going through the, the peak of driving, which you normally see in, 
in summertime. And I guess the question is going to be as we go into fall and move forward, what's that going to be? And really, what's it going to be regionally? This is a national view of it, but it really changes um, as we go into the different areas. So if we move into more like how people drive as opposed to how much they drive, we decided to take a, a look of one activity, which is speeding and high mild speeding. Um, we did this over 80 miles an hour. We also have a view of over 100 miles an hour, which is uh, shows some incredible spikes as well. But what you can see, again, normalized to uh, what things were like, this number of miles uh, driven that have these uh, over 80 events inside them. 2019, pretty predictable. 2020 happened when people hit the road again. There wasn't as much traffic on the road as our how we surmised it. So people went fast and people went really fast. What's happened in 2021 as uh, we got out of January and February, started to move back towards the, the, the middle part of the year, it's still well above. Again, could be due because the, the density is there. There's also a, definitely been a movement of people more to the suburbs and to rural areas where it's probably easier to drive a little bit faster, but it definitely was strikingly different. Why this one matters? and it's not in, in the good news category. Why this one matters is there was more fatalities last year than any time since 2007. That it, it was a bad year for, for fatalities and, and really when you start going faster, uh, people were able to um, maybe move about without some of that traffic density, but when they did get into collisions, they were much more severe. And we really need as a kind of a society to take a look at, at that. Um, as we look at 2021 and we see it trending above 2019, but still trending um, higher. Uh, let, let's just hope as we move through the, the latter half of, of this year that that stays in check and that they, the fatalities come back down because it, it was uh, just disheartening to see that much fewer miles driven, but yet the, uh, the fatalities are up. The other interesting insight that I wanted to share with you is around when people drive. So when you think about that and you break it down into the different uh, groups, we have a view that shows on the next slide the, the different periods of time of when people are driving. It's a little bit of an eye chart. If you come to our website, you can uh, see a little microsite and you can kind of dig into this a little bit. But the, the interesting one that I want to highlight is the, the teal bar, which is the, the morning rush hour. And if you look through 2019, generally speaking, like that's where a lot of your miles are driven. And that's almost always the most dominant one, except in the summertime when people kind of let out and, and take their time uh, driving when there's more sunshine and kids are out of school. But outside of that, the morning commute was really the thing. And it was an area where um, people were always on the road and there was a lot of consistency for, for companies to understand that. We went into the pandemic, you can see the big drop again. And then when it came back, what came back the strongest was the weekday midday. So again, most people working from home or not most, but, but a good number of people working from home during last year, so they were able to get out during the weekday and their driving actually increased quite a bit during that, that weekday period. One thing you also saw was the, the evening driving was uh, significantly less going through the pandemic. Um, a lot of things weren't open and now that's peaked. Um, what we don't know right now, because it's September and if you look at the 2019 comparable over to the side, like in the summertime, people generally do do that. So what we'll have to look for and see as we go through the, the rest of the year is how does that change? So the takeaway from this is we need to think differently about it. If you're designing apps, you need to be thinking differently about when people are gonna be using your apps. If you're advertising and trying to catch people in the car, maybe you should be looking at different times of day in order to do that. Um, same with uh, ride share, car share demand, uh, duration of um, even kind of how the roads are utilized. All that's going to be dependent upon how this settles out over time. Anyway, as a, a brief uh, preview of the report, um, hope that uh, you take away a little something from that and then I'll turn it back to Mark. Thanks, Gary. Uh, now, what do you think is the single most important statistic from this report? Uh, what should be our big takeaway? I think the, the big takeaway is just how how much that the mileage is up and the migration of people inside of it. When, when you look at this and see mileage up overall, if you start to delve into the details, you actually can see that the, the urban areas, there's a lot less drivers in there, even though those drivers are driving more, but people are moving to the suburbs and people are moving to the, uh, the rural areas. And that's really evident inside of the, 
the data. So between that element and then the idea of just we need to be be safer, we need to concentrate on our on our driving, and then uh, I guess think about the the times uh, that people are using them. But I think the biggest one is kind of this this overall migration, and it's just changed how people use their vehicles and go about their day. And Mark, how about you? Uh, what do you think is the most important number in Aries report? Well, everything that Gary just said is very consistent with what we're seeing with uh, Gas Buddy. And certainly, I would suggest that the most uh, important takeaway is that is certainly when people are driving, where they're driving, certainly and unfortunately, the speed at which people uh, were driving has changed. But I think the frequency of driving, the amount of miles that American drivers are, are driving hasn't changed. And we see that as well in um, fuel consumption. Uh, you know, we're going through a period right now where there are more cars on the road pumping more gas than at any other time in recorded history. So we're in a very sort of schizophrenic mo uh, uh, moment between where we want to go from a mobility question versus where we are. So I think it's, again, the, you know, America is the great car culture and Americans are very much still heavily reliant on their vehicles. Now, which pandemic driving and travel trends do you think will actually stick in the long run? Uh, Mark, let's start with you. Uh, so I, I think it's basically the the shift in uh, when the driving's happening. Um, you know, about 80% of all uh, driving in the U.S. is um, under uh, uh, 30 miles. So uh, I definitely will see that the influence of a very large percentage of Americans now who have either, you know, permanent work from home flexibility or meaningful flexibility on being able to work from uh, remote locations, uh, I think is going to have, uh, continue to have a big change on um, the shift of where vehicles are starting and ending a trip. Uh, I also think as well, because of what will be an increase potentially in short haul trips, that that does pretend to the continued acceleration into um, EV vehicles. You know, we've seen a doubling of uh, EV uh, vehicle sales is still just, you know, just two and a half percent of the total um, uh, cars on the road. But I do think that a lot of the, you know, I think the pandemic sort of made the future what not what it used to be. Um, and I think out of what was a very uh, difficult event, there are some silver linings. And those silver linings are uh, more flexibility and autonomy um, uh, for workers. And I think that does have a direct impact as well on uh, driving habits and behavior. And Gary, what do you think? Uh, which driving and travel trends will stick around? Yeah, I, I think there's exactly kind of what Mark was saying. The This morning commute and the amount of time that we used to spend, the, the hour going each way to and from work, and the more people that you talk to, at least um, uh, anecdotally, the, the way that they view that morning commute and the amount of time that they, they feel that was wasted in the, the car. Um, I, I think that's changing a lot. Um, similar with the some of the plane travel. We're seeing a lot, uh, there's a lot less of uh, plane travel. I think that's starting to come back. Probably Delta has a lot to do with that um, right at the moment. But the idea of even a meeting like this, that uh, we all would have got on the planes and, and spend time to, to get to San Francisco for the event. And, and now we're able to do that without that. So I think the way that people think about their time and value their time, and then finding these these optimized ways to to get their their work done or to get their errands run, and if they can do that and and really kind of better optimize the roads and better optimize their time, it, it's probably good for everybody. I, I think people will gravitate to what uh, what works for them. And Gary, what are the trends we've been seeing last year and this year mean for car companies? Should they be rethinking the way they design or sell their vehicles? Yeah, well, it's certainly been a uh, been a very interesting year with with all the chip shortages and and things that have that have affected all of that affected pricing for for cars and and otherwise where I think the some of the the trends could could affect them is better understanding how the vehicles are being used. Mark just gave an example of the the average number of of trips. Um, our data, I think it's like three point two trips per uh, per vehicle, and you start to see that those duration of those those trips. I think about people that lived um, that lived in the suburbs, worked in the city, took the train to and from. Uh, during the day, they never drove their cars. Now those cars are getting driven to the market and, and running errands. So I think from the from the car manufacturer perspective, how people will use the vehicles, how much of it will be on these trips into work versus uh, the, the shorter trips in the neighborhood, and and that that probably bodes well for uh, for just thinking about the the future of mobility and and when to use um, when to use EVs and and when you want to, uh, I guess, ramp up for the for the cross country trip, which um, 
at least in the in the current form will be with uh, with gas powered vehicles and moving about the country. Mark, how do you think car companies should be responding to their customers' new habits? Uh, it's a very good question, Mark, and, and I and I think that. Um, when you actually look at the vast majority of the cars on the road today, there are 280 million cars on the road today. And, um, you, you know, like I said earlier, only two and a half percent are electric. Uh, I do think now what the pandemic has done that, you know, America is, has been profoundly very much a sort of commuting car culture. And, and I think workers have traditionally needed to try to manage their personal life around their work lives. So, you know, Gary mentioned you've got that, you know, one to two hour commute in the morning, one to two hour commute in the evening, not a lot of flexibility in the traditional um, office environment. And again, one of the positive effects of what was the negative of the pandemic is the reverse of that. Because of the flexibility with remote offices, and, you know, I guess we have teleport teleportation now, not in the way that I imagined, but um, you know, we get to teleport ourselves to this event without having to be in a physical location. And I think now that new level of autonomy that Americans get where uh, their personal lives will come first and they're now going to be able to manage their personal lives first and they'll have more flexibility with the uh, work, li uh, work life, again, uh, will influence the acceleration away from um, gas vehicles um, uh, into v EV, you know, range anxiety was always the um, the early anxiety there. I see some significant comparisons as well between the e-commerce business that's quite matured versus the EV business. Um, the uh, the e-commerce business today is still only about 15% of all retail sales. Yet Amazon is about 50% of that 15 uh, that that 15 percent. Um, EV sales are only about two and a half percent of the cars uh, on the road. Yet Tesla represents 66 percent. Uh, market share. So I do think that you're going to see uh, more American consumers become more comfortable with at least having one of their two vehicles become EV. And you can see the autom the automotive manufacturers, now they're chasing Tesla. Tesla, Tesla has a breathtaking um, uh, head start, but you're definitely going to see all of the uh, OEMs lean in further faster uh, against their EV strategy. And it's really kind of an important part to the to the data that kind of plays into that. If it, if it used to be that I had to have that second car, because right, we both need to, uh, my, my spouse and I need to both drive to work and we both have a 30 mile commute, whatever that might be. But now if you're home and you really want to take short trips and everything is kind of around the neighborhood, I'm guessing the car companies can really start to optimize it once they start to understand that people in these geographies or in this life circumstance are really gonna be optimized with a vehicle that works for them in that way. So I think it's a chance to, to create um, maybe some micro segments of how people will, will use vehicles and it, it'll be different, but it'll be better for all of us. Now, how should retailers be thinking about this? Uh, should they be reconsidering where they locate their stores or how much they invest in e-commerce versus brick and mortar? Uh, Gary, let's start with you. Yeah, in, in, in our marketing business, we, we see a ton of, of opportunity inside of that. The idea of understanding um, kind of where and how people are going and, and when they're when they're going. I think it changes dramatically as far as the the, the Starbucks off the off ramp in a certain area as opposed to being in in the, the area around the town center that'll make it more more convenient. Um, as, as Mark said, there's a, a ton of e-commerce and I, I think the Amazon guy comes to uh, um, comes to our house and, and she delivers our packages every day. But uh, there's a little bit of, of what it feels like to be um, at the market and at these locations. But I think understanding then how these movements are, are happening and then being able to advertise uh, accordingly to them to bring them into your store. Um, also, maybe the, just the time of day and like the, the factor of knowing that people are going to be out more, more middays. Um, we've seen a lot of stores in, in our neighborhood that are taking certain um, less evening hours than what they used to run before simply because people are able to, to do errands during the day. So I think the retailers are going to have a, um, have some uh, great opportunities to, to create great experiences for, for consumers that work around how people now want to want to live and work. And Mark, uh, what adjustments do you think retailers should make, if any? Well, I mean, I mentioned e-commerce uh, earlier. I mean, 85% of all consumption still happens in the real world. The e-commerce business is about 15%. So, you know, uh, we haven't quite completely become virtual um, uh, creatures yet. 
Um, and look, when I look at the fuel and convenience business, uh, which a, a gas body plays a very big part in, it's a trillion dollar addressable market. But the Achilles heel of that business is that there's little to no margin um, on the uh, fuel. And it's a huge business. You can imagine there are about 40 million Americans spend a billion dollars a day in gassing up. But the margin for the fuel and convenience industry is in the convenience store. The challenge there is dwell time. It takes about three minutes to um, fill a tank. Um, of gas, whereas charging uh, has a very, very significant uh, and longer uh, uh, dwell time. So you are seeing a pretty significant reimagining of what that trillion dollar convenience experience um, looks like. And then, uh, so taking into account that um, you're going to have people uh, uh, coming potentially less, frequent, uh, less frequently, but when they do come to charge or to gas up, and by the way, for the record, at Gas Buddy, despite her name, in the long term, whether people are charging up or gassing up, um, we're excited uh, at the transition um, from fueling um, to EV because of the profoundly positive effect it's going to have in the fuel and commerce, uh, fuel and convenience uh, business due to the significantly longer dwell time for EV charging. And Mark, what are the main lessons a ride hailing scooter and other kinds of mobility companies should be taking from the way their, their customers' uh, travel habits have changed? You know, I, um, certainly I've been part of the mobility conversation for a, a decade or more. And, you know, in the early days, and <laughs> you mentioned scooters, um, you know, there the, the were grand ambitions, by the way. Um, about mobility and I think earlier there was some expectation or hope rather that we could shift Americans out of their personal vehicles uh, into other mobility options. Uh, we have not seen that uh, play out. Um, certainly we anticipate as well that uh, America is the great car culture and will remain the same. The positive change will come from the switch from uh, gas vehicles uh, to electric uh, vehicles. Um, you know, there was a discussion earlier. I'm always fascinated with the, the phrase of smart cities, um, certainly in an area where we're kind of looking at some dilapid dilapidated structure. So I do think that it's the classic thing that when the, um, um, the, the, uh, the, the pain of change uh, becomes uh, less than the pain of staying the same, that's when you get actual change to happen. And I do think there's a little bit of a a force function uh, has to happen. So I think grander and better incentives um, uh, on EVs and then more exciting electrical vehicles coming from the more traditional OEMs to start uh, chasing uh, Tesla. So all very exciting. I don't see the number of cars on the road becoming uh, less, but we do see a pretty significant acceleration away from internal combustion engines um, into EV. And I'm not sure the scooter is going to make it into the future mobility. Gary, what do you think should be the key takeaways for ride hailing and other mobility companies? Yeah, there's a couple things when I when I think about it. The um, the, the safety of the drivers is is really key. When you think of the the amount of money that the, all the platforms uh, spend to operate their business, the when people get into trouble, when cars get into accidents, they're either out of service or um, heaven forbid, people get hurt. It really matters. So I think there's opportunities when you look at at who are the speeders, who are the the good tiered drivers versus the others. We we have a like say the 30 million database today. We think we'll be able to do that on 100 million shortly to understand who the gig drivers are and who the safe gig drivers are. And I think that'll help with the companies as they try to recruit and attract the business. As far as the the when and the where, I think that's also going to be interesting too. We're, we're definitely seeing a trend of less drivers in the city. What I don't know if that means is there's going to be less ride hailing needs in the city. It could be, but certainly I think it's going to mean there's more ride hailing needs in the in the suburbs and maybe even drifting a little bit more to the rural areas or at least the, the, the less dense suburban areas. So I, I think it's going to be a, a bit of a change for them as they think about where to deploy their fleets and maybe some different ways of how to attract the right drivers into the right areas to support the customer demand. And Gary, which pandemic driving or travel trends look more like short-term you know, COVID-related an anomalies? Um, are there any insights that auto or retail or mobility companies uh, from the past couple of years shouldn't be placing too much weight on? I, I do hope that the, the speeding element of that, that comes down. When you see those huge spikes that we saw uh, last year, I think that was... Um, due to a lot being a lot less density on, on the road and people were finally out of their houses and, and driving. And it was just tragic to see 
what happened with, with that. Um, it certainly is causing more accidents and the cars are getting more advanced. So when they do uh, have collisions, they're more expensive to repair. So I, I think that that's a, a trend that's gonna continue, but I hope some of that severe aspect of it is, is going to change. Uh, I think the other thing is that the people want to be out and they, they want to move around. So to think that that those shelter in place, that people were going to get very comfortable in just being in their houses. I think people love people. They want to be around other people. And uh, and movement is going to happen again just differently. Mark, what do you think? Um, are there any trends in areas report that you think won't stick in the long run? Um, I, I definitely think and I hope as well that we will see a return to um, uh, long haul trips versus uh, short haul trips. Um, uh, obviously, during the uh, pandemic, and we're seeing the lasting effects that the distance of which the average person is traveling, you know, whether it's in a vehicle or whether they're uh, g getting on a plane, we've seen a pretty uh, substantial expansion of the, I guess, what would be formally called the staycation. Um, and, you know, th that is one of the things that I hope changes. But, you know, there is a little bit of worry about how long it's going to take and if we ever, in fact, return to the same levels we'd previously seen before the pandemic. And I want to go now to a question or two from the audience. Uh, the first one is, do you think there are big uh, technological differences between Teslas and other electric vehicles? Uh, Gary, we'll start with you. I think this is beyond my pay grade. We should have asked uh, asked the folks from from Cruise. I, I don't. I, I know that. Um, but I'll say it this way: that the reason that I like what Tesla has done is they they just set the bar so high and they push companies to go to go faster. And now you're starting to see the slate of of other vehicles coming into the market and starting to to apply pressure there, which I think is good. Um, and I used to work for a for a car company years ago, and and it's hard to build something like that in, in an element of speed. And I think Tesla has pushed the bar on that and probably made the, the migration to this better for everybody. But who will win in the, win in the long run, I guess I'll, I'll sit back and watch like everyone else. And Mark, what do you think? It's, it's a very good question. You know, um, the last revolution in the car industry was over 100 years ago when Henry uh, Ford started the production line. Um, and if you look at where cars were over 100 years ago versus where they are today, it has been very, very slow um, iteration um, uh, on the vehicle. So I think the credit that Tesla gets is that they made the future happen uh, faster. And it, it did take uh, the, uh, the, the boldness of Elon Musk to sort of dream the impossible and then uh, make it happen. And there were times where it seemed like he, he might not pull it off, but he didn't just build... Uh, a great EV vehicle, but he also built the, his own infrastructure to serve his own vehicles, which I think is breathtaking, as I mentioned earlier, with a 66% market share um, in the US. But to Gary's point as well, it's uh, it's it's heating up. Um, Volkswagen just actually passed Tesla in Europe to become uh, the, uh, with the leading market share. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure uh, that's accurate. Um, you know, uh, in many cases, companies are forced to the next thing rather than getting there themselves. And I think the wonderful thing that Tesla is doing, they do build a, a fantastic car and a great technology, but they are forcing the other OEMs to follow. Uh, and like Gary said, it's going to be possible, impossible to predict how this plays out. But when you look at the breathtaking head start that Tesla has with uh, close to 70% uh, market share, um, it'll, it's going to be a fast and hard follow with the OEMs, but it's still all to, all to play for, not too early, still not too late. Now, we have another question from the audience for Gary. Um, Gary, what can you share from Arity's product roadmap? What's the next big idea? It, um, what's coming forward is the idea of, we started with telematics, which is more understanding how insurance should be priced. We've migrated that into doing uh, advertising and, and marketing, have an audience now that you can target best drivers out of 100 million Americans. And, Really what's coming up now is a product called Arity IQ, which is going to allow you to price insurance at, at new business. We think there's a lot of opportunities, not only to disrupt the insurance industry, but there's also a ton that is happening for the rideshare industry and other parts of the automotive ecosystem. So we're we're excited to, uh, to keep gathering our data, supporting great companies like, like GasBuddy and, and our other publisher partners and looking forward to a great future. I want to talk now about a new feature in the GasBuddy app. Uh, that will give users advice on how to become safer and more efficient drivers. Mark, can you start by telling us what GasBuddy is and what that advice will look like? 
Yes, uh, thanks, Mark. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Gas Buddy is the uh, one of the top five most used travel apps in North America. We're the primary source for empowering drivers by showing them where the best price gas is based on their current location. Uh, and like I said, when you have 40 million Americans spending about a billion dollars uh, a day with a typical uh, on gas with the typical American family spending about $3,000 a year in gas, other than the violent depreciation of a vehicle, gas is the single biggest uh, cost of ownership uh, expense. And that's where Gas Buddy comes in. We help drivers save very significant amounts um, of uh, money on gas. And, and, you know, so the business has been around for uh, 20 years. We have been evolving and iterating very, very quickly. We have been very focused on personalization uh, and also um, app fatigue, allowing, you know, the, the average American consumer today doesn't down, 50% of American consumers don't download any new app, app. So through partnerships like we have with Arity with our new drives features, it's all about personalization. It's not an app for people anymore. It's an app for the individual person. So through the great technology that we have uh, within the Gas Buddy app from Arity, we're able to give real world driving feedback uh, to the actual drivers, one of the unique and personalized uh, experiences, which is there's the um, kind of odd but funny analogy of uh, the psychology of driving and that everybody thinks they're a good driver. Um, you know, anybody going faster than me is crazy and anybody that going slower than me is an idiot. But the reality is, is that we can't all be good uh, drivers. So uh, with the technology that we have with Arity, we're generating significant savings and also making people significantly safer by giving them real world feedback on their actual driving uh, through the app. Well, that's all the time we have for this conversation. I thank you very much, Gary and Mark, for sharing a glimpse into the future of driving. I want to take a moment now to remind our audience of the official event hashtag, Insider Events. Please help us spread the word around these conversations about the future of mobility. Another reminder, feel free to take our, our attendee survey at any time during the events. Uh, just click on the survey icon at the bottom of the page. And now on to our next session, led by Insider Senior Transportation Reporter Emma Cosgrove. Our guests will discuss the question of who is driving the push for sustainability in the transportation industry. Is it customers, companies, policymakers, or all three? Emma, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Today, we've gathered a panel of experts to take a close look at what really works to drive adoption of more sustainable models in transportation, where pressure to make electrification a widespread reality is coming from today, and where it might come from in the future. It's always a critical moment for climate change, whether it makes headlines or not. And the panelists we'll hear from today know that better than most. So since urgency is what's needed in this discussion, let's meet them all right now. Aditya Jairaj, Director of EV Marketing and Sales for Nissan, is in charge of how Nissan needs to change in the electric age. Aditya, in just a few seconds, what's your top priority this year? You know, my top priority this year is to make sure that uh, the entire ecosystem is further prepared for this big change that is coming upon us. The change is already here. So making sure all the different stakeholders, internally and externally, are prepared to embrace this change is uh, the number one priority. Fantastic. Uh, we also have with us Alyssa Mudo, Director of Sustainability and Mobility for the City of San Diego. Alyssa, same question. What's at the very top of your to-do list right now? Oh, thank you, Emma. For the City of San Diego, the top of our mind is our update to our climate action plan, really focusing and centering around equity and further reducing our greenhouse gas emissions as a city where we can walk the walk um, and step out there and be part of the solution in uh, the effects of climate change and resiliency. Great, thank you for that. Uh, and finally, we have Alvaro Sanchez, VP of Policy at the Green Lining Institute, which seeks to harness vehicle electrification to address historic inequality. Alvaro, in just a few sentences, could you share a bit more detail about this mission for those who may not see an obvious link between electrification and equity? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, the link is that, um, you know, we're going through a revolution in our transportation sector, and we have to do it urgently because of climate change. But as we've seen through the development of our cities, our transportation infrastructure, uh, many times, particularly here in the U.S., communities of color have been left behind. 
And those communities uh, have been locked in with poverty and pollution. So as we move forward and we are bringing in a more sustainable, cleaner form of mobility, we want to make sure that we don't repeat those mistakes of the past and that we take this opportunity to, uh, to address systemic issues that our communities have been facing in vehicle electrification and mobility are a perfect way to be able to introduce that into these neighborhoods. Wonderful. Okay, hold that thought, Alvaro, because I'm coming to you again next. Let's set the table for this discussion. We're going to talk about the future, but from each of your diverse perspectives right now, where are we in terms of progress toward the kind of shift we need in the transportation sector to meaningfully impact global temperature rise and equity? Alvaro, why don't you go first? I would say we're at the very early age, uh, stages of uh, our path towards cleaner, more sustainable, more equitable communities. And unfortunately, we have to speed up uh, really quickly, but we have to do, the, do that very intentionally so that we don't replicate the mistakes of the past. Uh, where we are right now is that our communities that are most polluted are also the ones that suffer from the most amount of um, poverty. And these are the places also that have the least amount of political capital and financial capital to be able to make a transition towards a healthier environment. And as we're seeing now with Hurricane Ida, with wildfires, these are the same places that are most vulnerable to climate change. So we have to speed up everything, our adoption of electric vehicles, our policy, our citizen uh, you know, mobilization to, to demand that these things happen in our communities. And we're just getting started. California is further ahead than most of the country. The federal government is quickly catching up, and I'm excited to hear what they have planned, but we need to do so much more, and that's just here in the United States. Globally, we're even further behind, unfortunately, um, but some good things are coming out of California and other states that are taking on this fight. Gotcha. Well, we've got the right person to tell us about a little bit of California. So, Alyssa, could you uh, set the table for us as well? Where are we right now in this journey? Well, so I think it's about, you know, when we look at our mobility, our mobile source emissions, those comprise for cities over half of the emissions that we have um, that we need to reduce to get to zero. And first and foremost, focusing on how we can create mobility options and increase choices for our residents. So for those who want to and need to take transit and bike and walk, making those safe and convenient options. But for those that need their cars, whether they have a family that they need to be able to move around the city or they have a service job, those cars need to move to an electrification. So how do we as a city support electrification for all of our residents? And as we see incentive-based programs at the state and federal level for increasing ownership, the charging component is going to be really critical. And that's a critical path for our city right now. This is great. You guys keep setting each other up. Um, Aditya, Nissan's been at this for a minute. Can you tell us where you see Nissan and the, the sort of broader ecosystem in terms of status toward electrical transportation? Sure, absolutely. So you said it right. You know, Nissan's been at this uh, for a while. So we introduced the first mass market electric vehicle, the Leaf, in 2010 with over 100 miles of range. So we know we have some history. We know uh, what customers are looking for, and we're building towards this. So if we just look at what's happening in the industry today, EVs are about 3 to 4% of the total industry. I'm talking about new car sales, 3 to 4%, right? That is, that is tiny. That's really small. And based on forecasts, in about nine years from now, 2030, that number will go anywhere between 40 to 50%, right? So what we're saying is, Today, you know, give or take, about 250,000 new cars are EVs. And in nine years from now, give or take, we're going to see this number is going to go to 8 million. That's a huge shift. So 250,000 to 8 million in nine years. I'll let you all do the math to, to, to calculate, you know, what the growth rate is every year. But the reason why I think, you know, we're at the cusp of this change is because there are uh, different factors that are helping this. Obviously, you know, we have the policymakers that are helping move this forward. We've got um, investments in this space. Capital uh, markets are spending a lot of money in mobility and EVs. So, you know, at, at some point, we'll see the fruit of it. And I think the third point is the consumers. Consumers don't know what they're missing out on 
until they test drive an EV. So consumer interest, it's a sticky effect. The more consumers get into EVs, the more other customers and consumers will want to get in. So I liken this to you know, the revolution that we had 100 years ago when we went from horse carriages to autos. For me, it's similar. We're going from internal combustion engines to EVs. That shift could take a few more years, but uh, we're at the cusp of it. Gotcha. Okay, so it sounds like, Alyssa, that Aditya thinks that the test drive is one of the most powerful forces we have out there. What have you seen or do you expect to make the biggest impact in overall admission reduction across consumer and commercial vehicles? I do think it's about the consumer experience, but it's also about the policy and how do we as cities um, or regionally create policies that foster EV ownership and that foster charging you know, we have a lot of residents that live in multifamily residential, so in apartments and condos, where maybe they don't have access to being able to put in a charger themselves. So how do we as a city create public spaces that not only charge our own fleet, but that can be available for public use for folks that have invested in electric vehicles and just need that charging location near their home? Gotcha. Alvaro, could you weigh in on that, please? Are you seeing multi-tenant homes get charging resources yet? Not nearly enough. And it's a difficult thing to, to try to figure out. Uh, from our perspective, uh, you know, new multi-unit buildings are a really good building stock to be able to electrify quickly, both for charging infrastructure and also building electrification to reduce emissions from build the building sector. But the sticky point is uh, existing buildings. How do you retrofit existing buildings to be able to absorb charging infrastructure and other forms of electrification. And how do you do this, again, intentionally so that we don't displace tenants of those buildings so that when the transition happens, the affordability of the building itself, the rental units, don't go so far up that they, the people that live there now won't be able to live there uh, afterwards. It becomes a really complicated policy discussion. And I do want to emphasize the policy discussion because alongside with charging infrastructure, which is a policy decision, uh, we also have to think about tenant rights. Uh, and we also have to think about just the, the financing of some of these upgrades because the existing building owners sometimes don't have the necessary funding to be able to make the upgrade. So it's a very sticky issue and we don't quite see enough of it yet. But I do wanna highlight that one of the things that we are seeing is the deployment of electric car share programs cited at multi-unit dwellings. And I think car share programs for multi-unit dwellings are a really exciting opportunity to introduce electric vehicles, to introduce charging infrastructure, and to do so in a comprehensive plan for what that building's amenities are. So we see this in LA, we see this in Sacramento and other parts of the Bay Area, and we're really excited about um, this kind of program moving forward being an option for people um, to use electric vehicles but not necessarily own those vehicles themselves. Great to know. Aditya, today we're discussing what's driving sustainability and Alvaro just mentioned policy. So other than consumer pressure, I'm wondering what other kinds of push mechanisms are out there encouraging electrification at the consumer level? So again, if we look at just policy just for a second, you know, policy in my mind is basically two things, right? It is helping create a bridge between now and let's say 2030 to help consumers embrace EVs. Why the bridge? Because let's face it, EVs are pretty expensive. We still don't have total cost of ownership parity between EVs and internal combustion engines. So that's, that's where I think you know, the, the bridge is important and hence the policymakers are helping there, that's one. Second, I spoke about this a little uh, uh, earlier. You know, the capital markets, you know, if we look at the amount of money that is being spent in the mobility space, in the EV space, there, there is a lot of untapped uh, interest that is coming out in terms of what these companies are offering consumers, right? So what you don't know what you don't know. And that, I think, is being alleviated as we move forward. So I think that in many ways is a push mechanism. And the third one, I think this, I would say, is very important. If you look at the market today, you know, the, the auto market in the US, about 30 to 40% are crossover vehicles, CUVs as we call it. And if you look at all the new EVs coming out, a significant portion of them are CUVs, right? So today, maybe customers buy uh, an EV because it's an EV. 
But as EVs become more pervasive, customers are going to look at, does this vehicle suit my needs in terms of space, in terms of luggage capacity, cargo capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So if CUVs are the, the, are the significant portion of new models that are being introduced in the market, and this is what consumers want, I think we're going to see that attraction from customers. So I think these are three important factors that are aiding as push. We spoke about policy, we spoke about products, and we spoke about the capital markets. Yeah, Alvaro, I want to throw that back to you. What do you see as the relationship between policy and markets, and how can that feed into equity? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to equity, what we see is that the market is not always great at uh, achieving equity. And so that's why then policy becomes a really important tool to be thinking about how to deploy these vehicles in a way that's more equitable for everyone. So I want to mention three important uh, policy decisions that happened in California, or one of them is being worked on. One of them is the clean trucks rule, which uh, you know requires the sale of trucks in California for a certain kind of trucks for 55% of them to be all electric by 2035. Pickups have to be 75% electric by 2045 too. So that's you know one market um, rule that now will make sure that these vehicles are available uh, and are being manufactured for consumer demand to, to be able to benefit from. The governor also um, signed an executive order banning the sale of in, internal combustion engines by 2035. That's another policy decision that will help speed up the market uh, and ensure that we have these, these vehicles available to everyone. Uh, we are also today, actually, there's a, a hearing on a, a fleet rule that would also require the purchase of fleets to be 100% electric by 2035. At least that's what we're pushing for uh, to be able to meet consumer demand in that way. And then the last policy this, um, you know, choice that uh, we, we are making is this year, um, California approved a $3.5 billion investment in the deployment of electric vehicles. $400 million of those are going to be specifically towards advancing equity programs that would allow low-income individuals to gain access to these vehicles and deploy different mobility options that meet their needs. So I think the combination of policy uh, and consumer demand is what's going to drive the adoption of the technology. But we have to be you know, really mindful that the market on its own won't address the inequities that exist currently in our society and in the way that people move around. Yeah, that's a point well taken. Alyssa, it sounds like some of the policies that Alvaro just mentioned might grease the skids for your work in San Diego. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, and I've worked, um, it, the city of San Diego has worked with the Green Lining Institute to get feedback on some of our building electrification work and, and outreach. And I really agree, you know, as we move forward to match our climate action plan with those state regulations um, and laws, or even go beyond that, it is then our responsibility to connect back with our underserved communities, to hear from them what they need, educate them on about electric vehicles and what the benefits are and what the opportunities are for financing and for charging where they might see that that's not feasible for them and showing them how we can support our communities and our residents to make that change to a greener option of mobility where they might choose or need to have a car. Um, and then on the same path or in parallel, we need to support our transit system and furthering our transit system to be efficient and to see that uh, piece of our mobility to also transition to electrification um, along with our fleet. So it's all working in tandem, but it is our responsibility as a city to work with our communities to make sure that they are supported. And Alvaro said it best is that we really need to make sure that we don't leave people behind and we can bring them along and get them the resources that they need and the information they need to make the decisions and move as unison as one. Yeah, understood. Well, it sounds like Alyssa and Alvaro may have uh, already answered this question, but we're going to go into a quick rapid fire round, starting with Aditya. If you had a magic wand and you could change one policy or consumer behavior, what would it be? We'd make sure we have enough chargers in the ground right now. Yeah, I think that's extremely important because, you know, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but putting installing a charger is not like buying a charger for your cell phone. It takes time. It takes effort, you know, there's permitting involved, et cetera, et cetera. So 
having enough chargers will alleviate amongst the top stresses that customers cite when they don't buy EVs. So if we can have these chargers in the ground, I think it would be a big, big win. So I think policymakers are helping with that. But I, I think this is uh, something that would be great if uh, we had a magic wand. Gotcha. Maybe that's everyone's answer. Alyssa, what's your answer? What would you do with a magic wand? That's, I think, a top of my list. I think also having the policies in place that anticipate new mobility technologies and new needs that we have. If I could just wave my wand and have a plan for how to ensure that we have charging, that's a big step in, in how we can move forward and the budgets needed and the money to get there. So those public-private partnerships are going to be key. Um, knowing that, you know, as we come out of COVID and a number of other budget constraints that we'll have to be creative in our funding solutions. So maybe it's maybe it's funding solutions. I can't help but notice these wishes are pretty complex, almost like this problem is also <laughs> complex. Alvaro, uh, you get the last word. What would you do with a magic wand? Well, just con to continue with the complexity of things, my, you know, I think what I would do is I would really you know, con completely revolutionize the way with, that we think about transportation so that we focus more on how we most sustainably and equitably move people versus how we move vehicles. And I think that just the emphasis on thinking about how do we more move more vehicles has really never allowed us to reimagine the way that we just think about mobility. So if an option for someone to meet their mobility needs is to be able to have a nicer street to walk on, I would rather have our focus be on that than just on figuring out how do we get everyone who owns a gas vehicle today to tomorrow own an, an electric vehicle. I don't think that that's the solution that everyone needs. It's a solution, but I think we have to open our minds towards revolutionizing the way that we're thinking about and planning for and executing for our mobility future. Wow. Well, I have a ton to think about. Thank you so much to our panel. I hope you walk away from today's discussion with a better understanding of what you and your organization can do to drive sustainability in whatever type of transportation you impact. Thanks for joining us today, and back to you, Mark. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Alyssa, Alvaro, and Aditya, for your insights on the transportation industry's push to become more sustainable. For our final session, we want to connect the dots between mobility data and the world of media and marketing. Insider senior advertising reporter Lauren Johnson and her guests will discuss how advertisers are trying to reach consumers in their cars. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Mark. Cars are the newest hotspot for marketers these days. They're using it to find audiences and hook audiences. And streaming platforms like iHeartMedia and Spotify are changing how people listen to programming in the car. Marketers are making huge changes in how they buy and sell ads as a result of these changes, with advertisers investing more in programmatic technology and publishers betting big on acquisitions to fill this space. To talk us through all of these changes and more, I'm joined today by Melanie Elliott, Global Head of Strategy uh, for Ford at Mindshare, and John Vermeer, Executive Vice President of Digital Distribution and Platform Partnerships at iHeartMedia. So I want to maybe start kind of level set by asking each of you, but I'll just start with Melanie, just in terms of how you're seeing, you know, this kind of evolution of in-car advertising today and maybe what's different about it than, say, the traditional radio spot that people are, are used to from, you know, 50 plus years ago. <laughs> well, I, for me, I, I see it as an incredible transformation. So... What's happening now is in-car technology is advancing and, you know, what we see as a traditional ad of just being delivered as, as part of your radio programming on a commute is going to completely change. So things like platform integration, content integration, and the way in which that gets us, gets delivered in the in-car experience is going to change. And, and the, the beauty of it is that it opens up opportunities, not just for the in-car driving experience, but the planning of your drive and then what happens after you finish your drive and transit to work or purchases or, or perhaps you change your mode of mobility. 
radio has been evolving for many, many years, right? We're constantly introducing new products across all the different ways that we reach consumers to help advertisers deliver the right message at the right time. Um, you know, that for many years has been things like you could integrate into a weather break or a traffic ad. You could do a traditional 30 second or 60 second spot, or you could use personalities and, you know, what we think of as radio influencers to, to communicate a message to a consumer. What's changing, I think, is digital and new platforms that Melanie touched on coming into the car and creating new ways for content to arrive. So, you know, with things like CarPlay and Android Auto, uh, we can now deliver streaming experiences in a way that we previously could not do. And that's, of course, opening the door to all sorts of new ways to, uh, to connect advertisers through to end users. Let's also talk about how you think about planning a campaign in terms of what someone's kind of in the mindset of before they get into the car, what does that ad experience look like when they're in the car, after they've arrived at their, de at their destination? You can kind of talk through all the different phases of it. For us, it's, it's thinking about the context. So any in-vehicle advertising experience should be just that, an experience. So it shouldn't be traditional advertising of trying to cut through and break through your driving moment and create any level of disruption. It should be planning what it is that you're going to deliver to enhance a driving experience and the many different types of experiences that are available to do so and to think it through and, and make sure that it's contextually relevant, that it's delivered and, and, you know, as well as audio thinking through the voice activation component of what that experience could be, making sure that what you're delivering um, is customised for that person's driving experience, whether it's a commute or a long drive or perhaps, you know, distribution and logistics comes into this as well in terms of B2B, but it's all about contextual. Yeah, building on that, um, day parting has been the historic way of doing context delivery. So if you're a fast food chain and you want to connect with uh, a commuter on their way home because you want them to stop off at your franchise location, we've done that by building a media schedule around day part. But what's changing and what's exciting is we're introducing new tools to allow marketers to do that in new ways. So it might not just be about time of day. It might be about a demographic or it might be uh, more about a, you know, a more personalized connection with the, with the consumer that we know because of digital behaviors. But to build on that, an example would be, you know, when you see Google integration into to vehicles and the mapping device that comes with that, there was a lot of, you know, excitement about the opportunity to deliver ads in navigation when it was on a mobile device, but it kind of changes and opens up new opportunities when you're in the car and having, you know, your regular commute that you might stop by Starbucks at a regular time, your, you know, your route gets changed because of traffic conditions. You have the opportunity as a brand to serve up different content to recommend the types of experiences and transactions that you might usually have experienced in and planned out yourself, but actually having it delivered in your vehicle voice activated by the driver themselves. Is that just a factor of the consumer intent, in other words, just being different when you're in the car? Or how, how is the kind of the mapping experience on a mobile device different um, from an ad that you're going to see on a mapping system within, within the car? I think it's probably more about the way in which brands can deliver messages through that experience. So integrated mapping, being able to activate audio ads to call out the contextual placement of different businesses around you, depending on what you might be searching out in your commute, whether that's, you know, the obvious ones would be fuel and you're running low on fuel. But, you know, I feel like stopping off for a drive through coffee is also a huge thing in terms of people's general commute. And so it's about the ability to use the, the data within the vehicle, your understanding of a consumer's behaviour and enabling them to actually trigger it themselves if they wish to, to deliver them a different kind of experience and, and brands have a huge opportunity to support that. I can't miss the opportunity to just plug, you know, part of it's about meeting the consumer where they want with the content that they're looking for. And a part of that content will be advertising. But talking about mobile brought into the vehicle mapping with Waze and with um, Google Maps and Apple Maps, all of those things, we've actually done a number of iHeartRadio integrations into those environments that allows a consumer, when they're doing a mapping, a projection on a, a vehicle head unit, to actually toggle into a digital listening experience directly from the map. So it's, it's finding new ways to get to the consumer and then new ways to connect the consumer to the advertisers who, of course, are, are seeking their attention. 
Yeah, John, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts just on how iHeart is selling ads differently. I mean, you obviously have this, you know, a, a platform of radio stations, but you also have been growing quite a bit through digital platforms. So has anything changed, like you mentioned, day parting? Anything else that sort of changed in terms of what you see advertisers, you know, looking for when they're coming to, to you to buy ads? On broadcasts, we've introduced a platform called Smart Audio, uh, which is effectively programmatic buying for broadcast radio inventory. So it allows advertisers to more effectively target who it is they want to reach through a whole digital dashboard and a series of tools that are much more like they're used to interacting with on digital platforms. And then if you flip over to the digital side of our business, constantly and there's so much opportunity there for innovation just recently we announced with amazon alexa uh, that we are doing digital via alexa live requests so a user in a particular market could ask their alexa to play a specific song on a broadcast radio station and then dedicate that which gets played out over broadcast well, you can imagine there will be lots of opportunities there for advertisers to sponsor that sort of a product. And so we're delving headfirst into those conversations um, literally right now. So uh, exciting times ahead. That's interesting. The other thing I wanted to talk about is we kind of spoke about this in leading up to this panel is that people are spending so much more time in cars right now. They're buying cars maybe more than they would have expected, at least during the past year due to the pandemic. How has that changed how you think about your ad budget? It's definitely a trend that we're seeing, the beginnings of a trend that we're seeing as people are coming back out of lockdown in different parts of the world. People are thinking or rethinking the way in which they might want to take on their regular commute or, or regular trips and having ownership of a car or accessibility to a car is, is becoming a big part of that. I'm not sure if that's dramatically changing the ad spend right now. But I think as you see connected vehicle experiences come into play and 5G networks start to really get penetration across you know, different markets, you'll start to see the opportunity and what is available in terms of inventory and different types of platform integration, similar to what John has talked about. All of the applications that you would currently have in your phone, they're all going to have to create customized application versions that are voice activated and enable a different experience in a vehicle. And so... I guess the, the exciting thing for where the advertising spend could go is if platforms are able to deliver more uh, innovative solutions for brands to appear in those spaces in, as I mentioned before, in contextually relevant ways, there's a great deal of growth that could be delivered for brands as they start thinking through where their advertising spend should be going. Melody, maybe we could have a follow-up conversation about the Alexa uh, in-vehicle song dedications and having a, a partnership with Ford around that. Uh, <laughs> I love that but, idea. <laughs> uh, no, and I would just, I would follow on that and say, you know, it's been a really, I think, challenging year and a half in a lot of regards for business. However, there have also been, you know, innovation opportunities and things that have been forced as a result. What we've seen with our business is actually just a, a, a constant migration of listening between different platforms and different listening occasions. You talked a little bit about how, you know, rider, there, there are more people riding in cars at the moment than perhaps there ever were due to just levels of comfort, which is great for us. Um, but during the, you know, the three or four months when the majority of the country and the world were really completely in their living rooms, uh, we saw lots of migration towards digital listenership on OTT platforms and voice assistance. And all of that is a, a signal, I think, that the consumer is craving connection and companionship. And that's what radio personalities are able to do. And of course, bring the advertisers through to make that connection. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about programmatic, because there has been a lot of movement in that space in terms of advertisers investing more in programmatic audio. John, just to help us kind of understand here, how significantly is programmatic to iHeart's revenue at the, at the moment, and how do you see that growing? Yeah, I'm not going to get into specific revenue numbers, <laughs> but I, I will say earlier this year, uh, we acquired Triton Digital, which among many things that it is, one of them is a programmatic ad serving tech stack. So that, of course, will be important to our business going forward. There's also, I think, a, a recognition and a huge groundswell happening around different forms of audio. We've been talking for a number of years about the audio renaissance or the audio revolution, um, and it's nice to see, I think, a lot, the rest of the, the tech community 
identity and, and sort of the market sort of also starting to acknowledge and recognize that reality um, is that, you know, people are looking for ways to do, like they've run out of time with their eyeballs. So ears become sort of the new way that we can reach people. And so, you know, programmatic is one way to do it. Podcasting, uh, host read ads and connections to personalities. That way is certainly a big way to do it. You know, we'd love to talk more about that if that's an opportunity. But yeah, it, it's definitely programmatic is certainly a big part of our business going forward. Do you see a particular type of advertiser leaning into it more? These big brands, small brands, who's kind of doing it? You'd be surprised. Podcasting in particular, right, if we're going to lean into that for a second. There's been a, sp a particular type of advertiser historically that has been a podcast advertiser. However, what we've seen in the last year and a half is we've seen a lot of much larger brands that are not, you know, the typical direct response type advertiser you might have seen in podcasting delving in. Uh, and for us, it's a great opportunity to say, okay, we've got these great podcast assets that we can we can use to help you reach your audience, but we could also amplify those using the mass reach tools that we have, like broadcast radio and our streaming platforms, uh, to help further amplify it. So for us, it's been a boon, and it's been it's been refreshing to see new advertisers from all sorts of different categories, sort of throwing their hat into the ring and, and having conversations with us about how we can push boundaries. I'd build on that with some of the bigger brands because podcasting has been perhaps a bit less mainstream until maybe the last year or so, year and a half. It, it has meant that it's used by by brands to try and very be, be quite precise about targeting new audiences and the different kind of consumer group as you start to see the scale of podcasts growing and, and to John's point as people are using their ears to listen and learn and find out new things about the world you'll see bigger brands finding the opportunity and the inventory to make bigger more scaled decisions in terms of delivering through audio and, and podcast and streaming. Melanie how significantly I guess are your clients investing in programmatic when it comes to audio? I would say, like John, not going to talk about any specifics, but I'd say that programmatic audio is is still quite new, and there's not a huge amount of inventory, of, like at a global scale, there's not a huge amount of inventory available. So there's a great deal of opportunities that we're doing testing out programmatic audio across different markets for specific groups. But I think as the you know, coming back to the connected vehicle experience, what 5G will offer and how that's going to transform what audio is, you know, from a vehicle being a vehicle to being an actual advertising platform in a way and all the sub-platforms within that, you'll see you'll see a change in the way that that transforms. And some markets in the global will be bigger than others, but it, it's certainly an exciting growth area, but I wouldn't say it's an enormous part of you know, trending budgets globally at the minute for, for any brand. You brought up 5G, obviously lots of advertising opportunities with 5G. What do you think that sort of is going to look like for marketers when that becomes more mainstream and, and sort of rolled out? I'd say it's going to become more confusing, more fragmented and more complex. But for us, it's, it's definitely more exciting because the amount of data and the speed of data that's available in any device, including a connected vehicle, is going to be enormous. So there's definitely a great deal of opportunity of building on some of the immediate content and platform integrations that will happen with connected vehicle now that focuses more on, you know, vehicle health, uh, safety, um, and some of the, the more hygiene factors of, of vehicle ownership it will start to transform what is available in terms of, of media. And I'm really excited to see what platforms and, and publishers do to see what they can offer up to brands or what partnerships we can actually have, you know, as media agencies with big brands and tech innovators to kind of have coalitions that get together and think about where there could be growth and, and good growth for businesses to connect in a different way with consumers. Yeah, everything that Melanie said, I would suggest that 5G is sort of an enabling technology. So it's it's not that the 5G itself is going to create the innovation, but what it does is allow less latency, it allows real-time communication and passing of data streams back and forth that create better user experiences. And once we have better user experiences, then we have better ways to eventually monetize them via advertising partnerships. So, you know, 5G is very much at play in the connected car world, and it's going to make a big difference, I think, as we go forward once it gets rolled out. And, of course, that's still uh, an ongoing process uh, we should talk to our friends at Telcom about. <laughs> you also kind of earlier mentioned Google, which I would love to 
talk about is, tr is in the process of making a big push into cars with its own audio platform within the cars. What's kind of the big implication there for marketers that they should know about? Yeah. So the Android Automotive Operating System is the official product name. Basically, it's Android, but fully embedded in the head unit of the vehicle. So you no longer need to have a smartphone with you uh, in order to power the connectivity and to power all of the apps that are running within the car. And so if you take that one step further, of course, that means there will be app stores available in the dashboard. And if you combine that with that 5G enabling technology, it all of a sudden makes your vehicle feel quite a bit like the smartphone that you've gotten used to over many, many years. And so for us, you know, we've been an early access partner of Google and have had an iHeartRadio app up and running on that platform um, in demos for a couple of years. And we're very excited to start seeing uh, that platform scale. So uh, there's a number of large global manufacturers that will be introducing it going into this fall and then, of course, into, into the years ahead. Um, and that will make a big difference in terms of the consumer's ability to access content the way that they want it within the dash itself and our mission and our mandate at iHeart has been just to ensure that whatever uh, environment a consumer is in whatever technology they're using we want to meet them there with the content and the services that they've come to expect from us so uh, for us it means a lot of digital a lot of podcasting and a lot of personalities directly embedded into the head unit great and then melanie we're also obviously talking a lot about about different platforms, there's a lot of different things happening in, in audio. How do you kind of help clients pick which platforms to, to be on and how do they basically run, you know, think about running campaigns in that way? Yeah, I think the key for any brand as you start to kind of enter any of these new frontiers is to be quite deliberate about what it is that you're choosing to, to engage in because it needs to remain authentic to the brand. And in terms of, you know, we talk about good growth for, for brands at, at Mindshare. In terms of developing good growth, you need to think about how you're adding value to the consumer experience or the audience you're trying to engage in rather than just being there because it's new and it's exciting. So I think that looking at the different um, opportunities for existing big platforms that would need to think about what their you know revised um, experience would be in, in vehicle would be a big part of that. But also just thinking about, you know, as people move into the new kind of future of mobility, smart cities as partnering with perhaps smaller, you know, startup kind of situations where you're able to kind of craft new experiences that become unique and connected to the brand. So it's not, I don't think it's necessarily going to be relevant to every single brand, but there's a lot of uh, exciting opportunities to think through the in-vehicle experience and the many brands that can add value to that. Um, and how they make connections with those platforms as they evolve. Right. Does the creative and messaging, sounds like that sort of changes between different platforms too. I think we laughed about this in the, the panel prep about I used to write TV, I used to write community radio ads and it was all about cut through, cut through, cut through. I think the, the creative and the message completely changes. I don't think you're writing a brief anymore about what is the message you want to put out. It's writing a brief about what's the experience you're trying to to design for consumers that's authentic to the brand and how does that in-car experience connect in with that overall ecosystem or is it something that might be a unique experience that you want to create as part of people's drive so it'll, it'll be less about what's the the message it's more about what's the experience we're trying to deliver so unfortunately we do only have time for one more question but i wanted to ask both of you if we were here a year from now, what do you think is going to be the, the big change in terms of in-car audio advertising, what's happening in the space? Geez, a year from now, it's an interesting one. I think I probably want to project a bit further out because I'm not sure how quick, quickly everyone's going to get themselves sorted <laughs> in a year. But, you know, in like three to five years, I, I would certainly like to see completely new experiences, new platforms kind of disrupting in the in-car space and the audio inventory that's available for brands to advertise through in a, in a more traditional sense but also you know more experienced design systems that enable brands to find more authentic ways to add value to a consumer's journey yeah and if i may i think over the next year melanie's right it, the car evolves slowly but next year or two years i i personally believe that podcasting is going to explode in the car. It's the perfect use case uh, for that medium. Uh, it's an evolution really of talk radio, and it's just about getting the right technology tools in place to make that easier 
for the consumer. And then if I could also add, if we go out three, four, five years, we haven't even touched on what happens when vehicles increasingly become autonomous. Uh, and how does that shift media consumption and behavior in the car? And of course, all of the new opportunities that that will create uh, for advertisers. So just to sum up real quickly, I'm hearing there's, you know, marketers are using location data and day parting and new ways to kind of target people within the car with ads. There's also a bunch of new technologies that we can look forward to, like 5G and Google's auto car platform that seem to kind of look poised to shake up a lot of the space. I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who joined this panel and um, we'll kick it back to you, Mark. Thank you, Lauren, Melanie, and John for explaining how marketers are thinking about in-car advertising. And thank you again to our sponsor, Arity, and to all our speakers for their insights about the future of mobility and how data drives innovation across all kinds of sectors. And of course, a big thank you to you, our audience, for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the conversations here today. In a few seconds, our survey will pop up on your screen. We'd love to hear your feedback. Again, thank you all for joining. Goodbye.